Hi, everybody. We'll get started in about 10 minutes. No, I lied. Eight minutes. I can tell time. Eight minutes. We'll get started in eight minutes. So feel free to get a glass of water, a snack, um, have some more coffee, tea, um, stretch, take a take a loop around your, uh, uh, your space, whatever. Um, and then we'll get started uh, promptly at 10 o'clock. So you've got a little bit of time and a little bit of space to do other things if you need to. No, okay.
Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in two minutes. So if you need to um, grab some water or a snack, um, stretch out a little bit, we have, uh, we're in a certain two minutes. Uh, if you're not hearing anything, that's because I wasn't talking. So uh, there is sound. Um, testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, it's 10 o'clock, so let's get started. Uh, this is a session about Google Classroom. Uh, Google Classroom is uh, one of the district's um, kind of like learning management systems, kind of like a digital classroom space. Um, it's best suited for grades three through 12. And this is going to be a true beginner session. We're going to talk about how to create a class, how to add people, how to add stuff. So if you have used Google Classroom before and you feel like you've already got the basics, you're welcome to leave. There's no hard feelings here. Today is for you. So if you, you know, if you're kind of listening along and you're like, actually, I know all this stuff, um, feel free to, de to dip out and go somewhere else. Um, use your time wisely. I, I'm not, I don't take offense. This is a true beginner session. Uh, if you've got some experience with Google Classroom, this is probably going to be too easy for you. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So if you haven't signed in yet for today, you only have to sign in once for the entire day. If you haven't signed in yet, please make sure you do that. Uh, you're gonna select Digital District Day under Synchronous PD, um, and then it's for seven hours for the whole day if you're attending for the whole day. If you're only doing my session, then it's one hour. Uh, but you're going to, um, you only have to sign in once. So if you've already signed in for the day, you do not need to do it again. I saw a question in the chat about if this session will be recorded. Um, let me let me make sure that it is currently, it's currently recording. Great, so yes, it will be recorded um, and uh, you can watch it later. It'll be ready by the end of the day. To introduce myself, uh, I'm Jessica Peterson. I am a digital learning integration designer, which I always joke is all the buzzwords in one title. I specialize in Google tools and I work on the digital learning team. My colleague, Allison, is here today. And Allison, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. As Jessica said, I'm Allison Rothman, also in Department of Technology, and I'll be helping answer questions in the chat. And if there's something that comes up that I can't answer or is appropriate for Jessica to discuss, I'll pause her at an appropriate time and have her talk about it. Um, in the meantime, if everyone could, keep their uh, microphones off so that we don't have any excess noise um, interrupting Jessica, that would be great. And just be patient, I'll type as fast as I can with your questions. Yeah, so I am super glad Allison is here. Uh, she is, she she's excellent and knows pretty much just as much about Google Classroom as I do. So she'll be able to answer all of your questions that you have. And Allison nicely alluded to our norms. Our very first norm for today for our time together is to please type questions into the chat. Um, Allison, that's her sole job is to watch the chat and answer your questions. So, uh, you know, as something comes up in your brain, go ahead and type it right in and Allison will, uh, will get back to you. Our other norm, which she also mentioned, is to please stay muted um, so that others can hear. Sometimes there's background noise, you know, a dog barking, papers rustling, um, someone in your in your nearby you coughing. I currently have construction noise down the street, so I'm hoping it's not too disruptive for everyone. Uh, but please stay muted to kind of reduce that background noise for everybody else. And then our last norm is my very, very favorite norm. Um, I always include it because I think it's really important. And that's to take what you can today and come back for more later. 
Uh, Google Classroom is a really is a really powerful tool. It can do so many things. We're just going to cover some of the basics today. But if you leave with just a handful of things that you know, you're doing great. I don't want you to feel like you have to become this expert in Google Classroom in an hour. That would be really hard to do. So come back, uh, come back to this material, this information, get more resources when you're ready to. Just take what you can today, anything your brain can take in today, take that and come back for more later. All right, here's our agenda. We're uh, starting with some opening moves and some framing. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to create a class. We're gonna talk about how to add people. We'll talk about how to post things in your class and a little bit on grading. And then we'll wrap up with some tics, tips and tricks, um, such as you know ideas and resources and that sort of thing. Um, so we're gonna really cover those basics. Like I said before, if you're kind of watching and you're like, I know all this stuff already, um, please feel free to leave. There's there's no hard feelings. Uh, this Again, this day is for you to learn what you need to learn. So if this is not what you need, then go somewhere else. That's okay. All right, let's jump in with creating your class. To get to Google Classroom, there are two ways. You'll want to make sure you're accessing Google Classroom with your SFUSD account. So if you don't have an SFUSD account yet, you should wait before you create a classroom that you put students into. Uh, it's really important to make sure that you're using your SFUSD account when you're working with students or staff. Once you have your SFUSD account, there are two ways to get to Google Classroom. You can type classroom.google.com into your address bar. Um, that's actually a shortcut for a lot of Google tools, uh, you know, docs.google.com, chat.google.com, mail.google.com. It's a really common, um, uh, uh, URL pattern. Um, so you can do classroom.google.com, or you can go into your apps launcher or your waffle. I've got a picture of it here. You'll find that in Gmail in Google drive and a lot of Google tools. You'll find that apps launcher up in the corner. It looks a little bit like a waffle three dots across and three dots down. And, uh, if you click on that, then you'll see classroom is in there. Classroom may not be at the top. You can actually rearrange where things are in your um, in your apps launcher, in your waffle menu. And so for the purposes of this picture, I dragged classroom to the top so that I could show uh, which sh show the two things together. But classroom might be further down. You might have to scroll down a little bit to see classroom on yours. Okay. Once you get to Google Classroom, uh, it's really simple to create a classroom. You just click the plus button and then you choose create class. Uh, every once in a while, there's like a handful of people that for some reason, uh, when they when their SFUSD account gets created, they don't get teacher permissions. If you don't see create class, just submit a help desk ticket and we'll get it fixed. Um, we don't know why it happens. Most people have no problem. They're seamlessly added as a teacher, uh, but every once in a while, it just, you may not see create class, just submit a help desk ticket. Uh, but to create a class, I click that plus button in the upper right corner of classroom and I choose create class. The next thing it's going to ask is some information about the class. The only thing you have to fill in is a class name and you can change it later. Uh, so I oftentimes do classes by period or um, if you're if you're like a, an elementary school teacher where you see students a lot you know throughout the whole day, uh, you might do you could do classes for different subjects if you wanted to or just have one class for all of your students. I taught high school so I did you know I had a first period classroom I had a second period classroom um, that was a nice way to keep all of the different periods separate. but you give it a class name and then if you want you can fill in section subject and room information. you don't have to. you can change any of these values later. So later if you want to add a room number, you can. Um, the only thing you have to put in right now is the class name, but even that can be changed later. So that little pop-up happens, you give it a name, you fill in the other stuff if you want to, and then you choose create. And that's going to build this classroom. Uh, this is what all classes look like. They all look the same and they all have the same layout. And so what's really nice is that, you know, as students move from classroom to classroom, you know, especially in like middle school or high school, where they might have multiple Google classrooms with different teachers using it. Uh, they, uh, the classroom is always laid out in the same way and the stuff is always in the same places. So it's a, it's really nice that it's, it's, um, kind of uniform. It can sometimes feel frustrating because you can't change the way that classroom is laid out, but, um, there's a lot of ways to, to put stuff into classroom. And so I, I've, I really like the way that it's laid out. 
This is what you'll see when you first create your class. This is the same thing that students see when they come to your class. I'm just gonna kind of give you a little bit of a tour of the different pieces I have uh, highlighted here. So I'm gonna start in the upper left-hand corner. There's um, three horizontal lines I call it the stack of pancakes. I guess I'm in a bit of a, a breakfast mood. I've got a waffle. And over here, we've got a stack of pancakes. Um, the stack of pancakes, if you click on that button, a little side um, drawer pops out and you can actually move between classes um, without having to go back to the main classroom homepage every time. So that's kind of like a navigational um, sidebar that when you click that stack of pancakes, it'll pop open and give you all the different classes you can go to in classroom. I'm gonna move here to the right. Up at this very top, there are four tabs in Google Classroom. Um, students can only see three of them. So you have the stream, which is your kind of like your announcements. It's always the first page people see in Classroom. You have your classwork, and that's where all the stuff goes. So you'll put assignments, you'll put um, resources or stuff would go there. All the, all the stuff goes in under classwork. People is where the people are. You can see a list of students that have uh, that you've invited or that have joined the class. You can also add co-teachers. And then grades. Grades is the tab that students cannot see. It's, uh, we're gonna talk more about the gradebook later, but we generally recommend that you just kind of leave that gradebook alone, especially if you're brand new to classroom. SFUSD uses Synergy as our official gradebook. So all grades, if you're using, if you're, um, if you teach grades six through 12, all scores and grades, um, A, B, C, et cetera, have to go into Synergy. That's the one that um, parents and families have access to. That's the one that students have access to, to see how they're doing in your class. That's the one that, um, that report cards are pulled from. So you have to use Synergy, it's a separate system. Uh, there is a way to tie Classroom and Synergy together. Like I said, we'll talk more about this grades column later, but just an FYI, we, we, you tend to not use it, especially if you're brand new to Classroom. Uh, so those those four tabs. You can tell which tab you're on because there's this dark, thick line that goes underneath the where you are. So right now I can tell I'm on the stream tab. If I were to click on classwork, that dark, thick line would move and would be underneath classwork. So that, that, that thick line tells you where you are. I'm going to keep going over here to the right. There's this gear or cog button. That's where you'll find all of your settings for this particular classroom. Uh, something that is, uh, it's kind of both a pro and a con, is you can set different settings for different classrooms. Sometimes that's frustrating because you have to go change the setting in every single classroom if you want them all to be the same, but it also allows you to do different things as needed for maybe different, um, you know, different class periods or you know, different uh, groups of people in a classroom. So that's a, um, that gear is the settings just for this specific class. Um, a little bit over, I didn't put a box around it, but there's your waffle again, in case you wanted to move to other Google apps. It's also built right here into classroom. And then I'm gonna go down and there's this customize button. The banner that's assigned to your class, you don't have to keep it. Uh, you can choose from a lot of preset options. They have tons of um, pre created um, themes and uh, banner images that you can use that do that deal with different subject areas and different things. You can also upload your own. Um, when you choose a banner or upload a banner, you can also pick what color. So in this case, my colors actually kind of match. I've got this tealy color for my classroom and my banner is also kind of teal. I could make my classroom pink and have my banner teal. Uh, you can kind of do different things and play with different things. Um, there are limited colors. So I will say that you can't do any color. Google has pre-chosen colors for you that are uh, more readable. You know, you can't choose bright yellow, for example, for your, your color for your classroom. But the customize button, there's tons of options. I usually use one of the um, preset um, banners myself because there's, there's, there's so many. So you click customize to change that banner. And then I'm gonna kind of circle my, my way around to the last box. And that's down here at the bottom. This is the upcoming work box. I wanted to draw your attention to it because we're going to talk about it more later, but you'll see it's here on the home, on, on, the, on the stream page. So the first page students always see when they come to your class in Google Classroom is this stream page. And so they've got this, um, this box actually will be at the top for them. Um, they won't see the class code. The meet link here is not visible to students. So this upcoming box will actually be on the top for them and it shows them which things are due soon. So it's kind of a nice reminder when they first come in, they can see, oh, I've got this thing due on Wednesday and this thing due on Friday. Um, and so that's, that box is auto-populated. You don't have to do anything. Classroom will fill it in for you, but that's where that is. All right, so that's kind of your basic get to know the layout of Google Classroom. 
the one of the first few things people like to do is they like to add people into classroom. And so there are two kinds of people in classroom. There are co-teachers and there are students. Co-teachers are teaching people, people who have teacher access to classroom. Students are student people that have learner access to classroom. Uh, the roles are, are different. And so it's good to know and kind of think carefully about who needs which level of permission. Co-teachers can see all student work and scores and grades for that class. Co-teachers can add, delete, and edit announcements, items, and people. So they've got really giant edit, delete, add access to classroom, to, to that particular classroom. They Co-teachers can view and or add private comments on assignments. So one of the ways you can give students feedback is through a private comment. Um, and any co-teacher in the class can um, see or add private comments. And then the other thing that co-teachers can do, which I think is the best thing that co-teachers can do is you can read a co-teacher can reuse a post from that class in another class they teach. So what we see a lot of times what works really well for collaboration as um, you're working with your colleagues, if you have a department that um, you maybe work with other people in your department, or if you have a grade level team, uh, we see a lot of people have other people from their grade level team be teachers in their class. So you can all reuse each other's stuff and assignments. So that's a really neat um, a really neat feature of co-teaching. Therefore, we recommend that you add any relevant adults as co-teachers. So it might be your administrators. It could be, like I said, your grade level team, a collaboration partner. Some people add their paraeducators so that the paraeducators can um, support with student work and that sort of thing. Uh, it it kind of depends. You might want to kind of think about, you know, strategically who, who should have access to these four things within my class. Um, it's also really nice sometimes to have a, you know, have like your admin in there because in case you're out sick or in case, you know, something happens and people need access to your classroom, your admin then can add, you know, a, a, somebody else to your classroom if need be. Uh, it's good to know that you can only have up to 20 teachers in a class. Uh, that includes you. So it's you plus 19 other people. For most people, that works just fine. Uh, we had some issues with that during the pandemic when people were really using Google Classroom as their main space in uh, post-pandemic or pre-pandemic times. We don't really see people hitting that limit, but it is just good to know that it's you plus 19 other people. And then when you add a co-teacher, they get an email that invites them to join your class. They have to accept the invite. Otherwise, they won't be a teacher in your class. So that's just kind of, again, a good thing to know that if they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm in classroom, I don't see your class, they have to accept that invite first. Let's do a quick chat check. So uh, go ahead and locate the chat if you haven't already. And I'd like to hear kind of, you know, as you're thinking, who are some people in your school site that you might want to have as a co-teacher in your classroom, giving them that, that co-teacher access to, to assignments and stuff and also student work. So go ahead and type that into the chat. Who Just who are some people that, at your school site that you might want to have as co-teachers? See grade level team, paraprofessional, admin, um, special education folks, that can be really good, especially if they're supporting a student that's in your Google Classroom. Um, SPED people are great. Uh, any co-teachers you might be working with, um, grade level teachers, ERFs, ERFs are really powerful oftentimes to have. Um, counselors, um, tutors, actually, I'm really glad that uh, somebody said that. Tutors, uh, only people with an SFUSD account can be added to your classroom. So you won't be able to allow, um, you know, parents or outside of SFUSD people, it's only SFUSD people. Um, reading resource teachers. Uh, somebody asked what's an ERF. An ERF is, make sure I get the acronym right, an instructional reform facilitator. Um, and they're kind of like a, a teaching coach at your school site. Every school site that has one, not every school site has one, but all the schools that do use them all a little bit differently, but they're a great um, teaching partner to help you kind of um, you know, target students who are having trouble, uh, supporting lots of students. It's a, ERFs are great. Um, counselors, yeah, I see speech, um, speech uh, teachers, all sorts of, all sorts of great people. These are great, um, great ideas. Uh, Jessica, can I pause you for one second? Yeah. I just want to make a clarification with regards to the chat. There are a lot of people who are messaging just me directly. If you find the button, it's usually blue at the top of your chat field where you're typing in and you select everyone, this way I can respond to your question. And chances are somebody else also is curious about something very similar. And that way the whole group can see the question that's asked and then my response to it, as opposed to me um, responding individually to multiple people for the same thing. 
Yeah. Thanks, Allison, for, for um, making us a little more efficient. Uh, Allison is really good at efficiency. Um, but yeah, lots of people you can add as co-teachers. Um, some I, A lot of people said their principal. The principal can also be really great because of that private comment ability that can you think about like maybe a student that would, you know, feel really motivated knowing that the principal saw their work and left a comment on it. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of you know, you, you want to think about, yeah, like what kind of people um, could benefit from access to student work and access to the assignments and things that you're posting. So, yeah, um, I see there's also a question in the chat about um, is the invitation automatically sent to a prospective co-teacher after you add them? Yes, you don't have to do anything extra, send that invite, Classroom does it for you. So you type them in and you push add and then Classroom sends out all the invites. Okay. The other people in the in the people space are students. Uh, students, you um, can there's a, there's a couple different ways to get all of your students listed there. One way is to invite students by their email address. You can you can also copy and paste emails from a list to add them all at once. Um, I I never use that option because students have to open the email or go to the classroom to join it, and um, it also I found it tedious to um, copy and paste in all the emails. So it is an option, but I will say that I personally never use that. Um, what I had students do is I had students add themselves by entering the class's join code or by um, they now offer a classroom join link. So if students click on the classroom's join link, uh, it actually puts them in the class as a student. It's really slick. Um, note that students can only join with their SFUSD account. Remember that um, only SFUSD people can be added to classrooms. And so students have to be logged into their SFUSD account. They can't join with a personal Gmail. Uh, but what that does then is it also makes your classroom really secure. You won't get anybody jumping in there that isn't um, isn't someone at SFUSD. The um, so I always did that students adding themselves. It was like one of my you know first first week of class um, activities. You know was it was like a I think it was a bell ringer when they came in like a must do when they came in a do now um, that they you know went to the class website that I had, or you could use like your Synergy class page um, that they went somewhere and added themselves um, to the classroom. That was that was just something I did myself and then they all um, were in there. Here at SFUSD, we also have a tool that ties Google Classroom and Synergy together. So um, anybody can use, uh, any teacher can use the um, Classroom Synergy sync that ties the two together and that will auto update your roster. So as new students come in, um, it will automatically add those new students. It does take about 24 hours. So that's just kind of good to know that um, what, you know, if a new student gets added to your class, you know, Tuesday morning, by Wednesday morning, you'll see them in your class because um, the sync happens every single night. So it goes through and, and syncs everybody overnight. Uh, so just, you know, if you don't see them the, the first day they're there, they should be there by the second day. Um, but that's, uh, so there's those three ways you can add students. It's also important here that we talk about, when we're talking about people, um, that there is no parent or family login for Google Classroom. Um, sometimes it might feel tempting to try to add families or parents as students in the classroom as well. Um, first of all, you can't because they don't have SFUSD emails, um, but it's also not an appropriate place to add them. Um, families and parents have access to parent view, which is the parent side, uh, family side of Synergy. And that gives them all sorts of relevant information about their students' attendance. Um, they can update their own information in there, like contact information, that sort of thing. Um, and so parent view is really the family place for information about students' learning. Um, if families want to see the Google Classroom and see what it looks like or see you know, what kind of stuff is in there, Families can ask their student to log in. Um, families can use their, there's, there's in parent view, their student's login information is there. They can see their own student's login information and can um, either log in themselves or ask a student to log in. Um, Classroom also offers email summaries that can go to guardians, um, which is Classroom's word for families or parents. Guardian email summaries are automatic. You add the guardians, you turn on the summaries, and then Classroom does the rest. I've got a picture here of what is in a gardens, um, a guardian email summary. It's important to know that this does not give them access to the classroom. It's just kind of like a summary email that summarizes all the stuff that's going on in the classroom. Um, it gives them information on any missing work, anything their student has not turned in. It gives them information on upcoming assignments, things that are due soon. And it gives them announcements that have been posted since the last time they received a summary. 
The summaries come um, either weekly or daily. If, if they have a Gmail account, if the Guardian has a Gmail account where they're receiving the summaries, they can choose weekly or daily. If they don't have a Gmail account, they have a Hotmail or a Comcast, then it's always weekly. Um, but the, the summaries automatically come. They can kind of keep an eye on things. They can. They, I really like the summaries because it, it can be a conversation starter that families can look at, you know, oh, I see there's this missing work, this missing information. Um, you know, what do I do? You know, you know, what, talk, they can talk to their student then about, you know, what's, what's going on with this? Have, have you turned it in? Have you talked to your teacher? Do you, you know, should we work on it together? Uh, that's a, it, it, I like it because it's a conversation starter, but it doesn't let them go in and look at their student's stuff. It doesn't let them um, see the classroom itself. Uh, any co-teacher in the class can add up to 10 guardians per student, and those guardians um, transfer between classes. So Google knows that if they're a guardian for, um, you know, maybe the student's second period class, the, the class that that student is in for third period, it keeps the same guardian. So that's really nice. Uh, and then guardians do have to accept the invite email. So the same thing when you add guardians, when you click add, Google will automatically send an invite email. Guardians have to accept it to start receiving it. So sometimes they have to check their spam folder. Uh, and then we have a link right here for a resource. Um, we have a resource just for families. It's family facing. It's meant for families to look at um, about guardian email summaries. You know, how do I find the invite? How do I, you know, what can I see in a guardian email summary? What is it? Um, why can't I see a classroom? That kind of stuff. All that stuff is in here. So you're welcome to share that information with families and share that link. Okay. I saw a question in the chat that um, asked what's recommended to do with your classroom from year to year. Um, I would recommend if, so if you're um, look, maybe here for a refresher, you've used classroom before, you're here for a refresher, we recommend archiving and always starting the year with a brand new classroom. It's nice to have a clean space. You can always reuse assignments and stuff from an archived classroom. So it's really nice to um, archive it. Allison, there is a resource on the Google website, the Google resources website um, under classroom about new classroom or like new school year, new classroom or something like that. Um, can you find that link and put it in the chat? I'm gonna give Allison a job. Okay, uh, let's talk posting and grading. When it comes to classrooms, it's really important to think about whose classroom it is. Um, in a physical classroom, we design our classrooms to support students and learning, right? We, we, I've got a picture here of an elementary classroom. Um, and in this picture, you can see we've got short chairs and low shelves because they're, they're little kids, right? We wouldn't give them giant chairs or big shelves where they couldn't reach the stuff. We design the classroom around them. Um, in this classroom, you can also see signs and labels and color coding. And that allows students to really be self-sufficient um, with routines. You know, they can have that, take that academic ownership and be like, oh, when I'm stuck, I know what I need to do. Or, oh, I know this book goes in the blue bin because it's got a blue sticker on it, right? So they, you know, we make these routines so that they can kind of do things themselves. We design the classroom around them. Um, and the same thing, you know, we put resources in this classroom. You can see that resources and learning tools are in a really visible and again, reachable space that kids can take that ownership and really feel empowered to do it themselves. And so we design our physical classrooms that way. We should also be designing our digital classrooms that way. You wanna design your Google Classroom to really reduce cognitive barriers. Um, cognitive barriers are, I've got th um, the three main barriers listed here. Barriers are the number of steps you have to take to get to what you want, um, the perceived length of each step. So like how long is that step gonna take? And then the difficulty of each step. So you think about um, maybe you've you've uh, tried to navigate a system where you had to fill out a form, um, but you know you had to maybe mail in the form. And right, you know, like when you get have all these extra steps to try to do a thing, it's a barrier and it makes it a lot harder. In physical classrooms, we remove those barriers, right? We make that we make it not very many steps. We make it so that it's easy to get to it. Um, you want to reduce those barriers in Google Classroom as well. When you remove those barriers, you free up students' cognitive load to be used on learning. So instead of them spending all of their mental energy trying to figure out where the assignment is, they just use that energy on the assignment. This also reduces their frustration and their anxiety. It's really hard to learn when you're mad or when it was really hard to get to the thing, right? Uh, so any anything you can do to kind of reduce that. And then you also, when you're removing those barriers, you're setting kids up for increased academic ownership. They can really take charge. They can feel self-sufficient. They can feel like they're in control of their own learning. Um, and everyone, it's, it's always easier to learn when you feel empowered. Um, feeling powerless 
is never a productive feeling. So you, you know, just like how we would design our physical classrooms for students and to make it easier for students, we want to do the same thing in our Google classrooms. Sometimes we make things easier for us and we design systems that are easy for us. I know I did this as a teacher um, from time to time, but you really want to, as you grow and as you become a better and stronger teacher, as you work with more students, really work on what's the easiest thing for the kids. So with all of that in mind, there's a few ways you can structure your classwork tab. So remember the classwork tab is where all the stuff goes, right? That's where your assignments go. That's where your resources go. And one of the ways to reduce those cognitive barriers is to use topics. So when you're on the classwork tab, there'll be a big create button. And if you click on it, it, um, the very bottom option is a topic and topics are like the backbone of your page. I've got a picture here of a page with some assignments on it. Um, and this big heading here with the dates, that's a topic. And on the left side, you can see it lists all of my topics. And so topics can really, when used strategically and used purposely, they can really help students again, take that ownership and feel self-sufficient and like they're empowered to find the thing they need to find. Um, one of our best practices we recommend is to use dates or weeks. Um, I was, I, for a couple of years, I used, um, units like unit one, unit two. And then, uh, after having to answer the question of which unit we're in so many times, cause kids just didn't know it didn't, you know, it didn't matter to them if we were in unit three or four. Um, uh, it was like, oh, obviously, uh, use something that they understand. So I used, um, dates or weeks for my topics. That's really great. Um, you also want to be strategic with what students see first. So you'll see that my dates here actually go in reverse chronological order. So the newest stuff is at the top. Um, the, the more that the student has to hunt for it or look for it, the less likely they are to, again, that's using that, that energy and that cognitive energy on not the assignment. So I always put my newest stuff at the very top. Um, and that's a really great way to really be strategic with what's, what's at the very top. Uh, some more tips for that classwork tab. Um, the top, again, the topics are giving that page structure. And so you can see actually here a little more of what more topics on the page looks like. Um, you can drag and drop topics. So, you know, as I make my new one, um, I can rearrange them by just dragging them and dropping them and it'll take everything inside the topic with it when you, when you rearrange it. Um, you can see, I've got a couple of things here at the very, very top. These things are um, filed under no topic which means they get pinned to the top. Um, I would use that for really, again, really sparingly. You wanna be strategic with that screen real estate. And so I, the things I've got here at the top um, are my course guide sheet, which is like my syllabus. And then I had an application. Um, students could, in my class, students could retake any assessment they wanted, um, but they had to fill out an application first to express interest in it. And so I had the application at the very top because when they come to classwork, they never have to look for that application. It's right there. It makes it really easy for them to, to do what they need to do. Um, later in the year, this, you know, this course guide sheet, I might you know, remove um, or file under, you know, towards the bottom, like a, um, like a, a, a class documents um, topic at the very bottom of the page. You know, I, I would probably move it somewhere else. I wouldn't leave it at the top all year long because you want to be strategic about that real estate. I've also seen teachers that put the stuff for today at the very top, no topic, and then, um, you know, drag it down under the topic it belongs under later. That's fine. It's kind of up to you if you want to yeah, rearrange that page a bunch, or if you just want to make it that um, everything is under the week's topic. A single item can reside um, in one topic only. So, um, you know, my, like my homework here that's due Wednesday, 429, I can only put it under one topic. So you do have to kind of choose where it's going to go, what bucket it's going to fit under. Um, you are limited. Another good thing to know is you are limited to a hundred topics. So we had some teachers in the past who did daily topics, uh, which was fine until you got to day 101 and then it was a problem. So, um, you can only make a hundred topics, but Weeks work great. Um, I've seen teachers again do like a today topic, and then when you know out the next day when it's time to put new stuff in there, they'll drag it down, or like a this week topic at the top, and they drag it down. Um, you can also put you know combine lots of old stuff into one topic if you want. So um, just go to FYI that you can only have one hundred. All right. There's some other things you can add to your page. So once you've got some topics, um, once you've kind of figured out what the structure is gonna be, that big create button, you'll notice there's other options in here. So topic was the one we just talked about, but um, you can also use assignments. Assignments ask students to turn something into you. 
it's got really great um, options within that because it because it's designed for students to turn something in. It's got really great options within it. I'm going to show you how to actually make an assignment here in a second. But um, for example, you can have classroom make copies of a template for each student, a digital template, make copies of it for each student, and then that's automatically attached to their assignment. Um, students can submit any file type pretty much. Um, there's I've, I've looked at the list of file types and there's tons on there that I don't even know what kind of file they are. Um, but PDFs, documents, spreadsheets, slide decks, pictures, videos, um, any any sort of thing you can think of. I think they can attach like Photoshop files. Like it's a it's a lot of stuff that they can attach. Uh, another one I'm going to talk about here is question. Uh, question allows you to ask the class one question, either short answer or multiple choice. There's some settings on it. You can choose whether kids can see each other's answers or whether they can see like a summary of answers. You can choose if they can reply to each other. I see a lot of teachers use it as like a discussion board, um, a discussion space where students can respond to something and then maybe comment on each other's. Um, I've seen the multiple choice used as like a poll. Uh, you know, if you're asking like what's um, which topic might be the most interesting thing to cover the next day or like the next unit or something like that. Um, so the question feature is pretty cool. And again, you can set it so that students can see each other's or you can set it so they can't. So you can ask, you know, something that's maybe very private. Um, you know, like, is there anything you want me to know as your teacher? And then students can submit an answer there and have it set that nobody else can see it but any co-teachers in the class. Uh, and then the other one I'm going to talk about here is material. Material, we don't... Um, Materials are just something for students to look at or read. There's no space in a material that turns something in. Uh, when you're doing materials, a lot of times materials have to do with an assignment and you can attach files to an assignment. So I can attach, you know, a reading or something to the assignment for students to look at. I don't need to do a separate material. So we don't see material used a ton. Um, I did use, I'm actually gonna go back a slide here. Um, I did use this course guide sheet is a material and the application is a material because they were um, they they weren't things students necessarily were going to turn in. The application was a form they push submit on. Um, this actually, so you can see like the paper with like a bookmark is a material. The clipboard is an assignment, uh, but mostly I do um, I do assignments and then I attach the relevant resources onto the assignment. And the last thing you'll see in this, I guess, second to last, because topic is the bottom. But the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, reuse post. The, the reuse post, again, is where you pull assignments and things from other classrooms. Any class where you are a co-teacher, you can take assignments from and use it in your own class. It's really slick. Um, I use it really heavily with my collaboration partners. We would take, you know, kind of take turns um, who was going to make the assignment stuff for the week or for the day. Or if I was like, you know, in a bit of a pinch and, you know, something had maybe come up and I hadn't gotten to planning, um, I was able to go and look at hers and take her stuff. And she always had the same option for me that she would take my things. Uh, and so it was really nice. We had this understanding that we were just openly sharing between the two of us. Um, when you reuse a post, you can edit it. So if, you know, I'm taking a post from that other teacher and I don't like the way that they worded the instructions, I can actually rewrite the instructions. But the, the template is there, you know, the, the basics, it, it's make, essentially it's making a copy that then you can edit of that assignment. So it's um, that reuse post is really, really awesome. Um, the reuse posts is also, since we talk about archived classrooms, next year when you're doing your new Google Classroom, if you do reuse posts, you can pull stuff from archived classes, classes that you um, have, you know, Kind of kind of like, like shut down because the year was over. Um, you can actually pull stuff from archive classes. So it's a really awesome, um, awesome, awesome feature. Uh, when you're looking at any of these things, so again, that assignment, the question, the topic, the material too, when when you click on it, it pulls up another window. In general, in classroom, look for down arrows and the three vertical dots. We call it the snow person menu. Look for down arrows and the snow person menu buttons. Under those, that's where you're going to find extra stuff. Um, for example, under a down arrow, you can differentiate by choosing students. Um, under another down arrow, you can post to multiple classes at once. I think it's a three dots where you can schedule to post later. So like, I can like make my... <laughs> In, a, in an ideal world, I'd make my assignment the day before and I would schedule it to post the next morning. Um, that is, that's never how I actually worked as a teacher, but the idea is there that, you know, or if you knew you were going to be out next week, you could schedule an assignment to post automatically for students to work on while you're out. 
Um, and then, like I said, classroom can make a copy of a template for each student. And so when you attach a, a template to the assignment, um, there's a there's a down arrow where you can choose make a copy for each student. So always kind of keep a lookout inside a classroom for those down arrows and those snow snowman or sorry, snow person, snow person buttons, those three vertical dots. And that's where you're gonna find those extra really awesome um, features of classroom. Okay, uh, some tips for the classwork tab. Uh, you can use, I, I recommend to use a really clear naming system. Remember we talked about whose classroom is it? Um, so I've got my picture here showing where it says in the title of the assignment, it says homework due this day. Um, and then it has a little bit, but you'll see if it gets too long, it cuts it off. So uh, you can kind of figure out what's gonna work for you. Uh, don't don't make the title too long. Um, that's a really good demonstration as to like, I can't see what the rest of that says. Numbers work really great. Um, you can number things and students can, you know, that kind of helps our brain because we know what order numbers go in. And so that helps our brain know. Um, it can also help your, um, you know, maybe like learning readers. If you're, you know, have some maybe students who are struggling with some reading, you can use numbers and they can find, you know, the number three assignment or the number 31 assignment. Um, the, you can also use acronyms. That's another way to kind of make it shorter. And I've seen teachers use emojis that um, they put an emoji in front of the um, the assignment name. And that also helps students kind of navigate to it or um, know that maybe like um, a flower emoji means it's an extra activity you can do when, you're, when your time is done. So kind of building those routines. Um, so emojis work in, uh, work in um, assignment names as well. So just kind of, again, think strategically, what's gonna really remove those cognitive barriers to make my page easy to, to find stuff on. We are gonna talk about due dates. Uh, when you create an assignment, it asks you to submit a due date, to put a due date on it. You don't have to put a due date on it. Um, so if it's an ongoing thing, um, you know, or if you're gonna set the due date later, if you're not sure, you're like, we're gonna kind of work on it, it's a project, we'll work on it and see, and then I'll set the due date. Um, you can change, you can set it later, but it is good to add due dates sometimes because due dates feed automated spaces in classroom. So those guardian email summaries are looking at what due dates to know what upcoming work um, to to share in those guardian email summaries. Remember we saw that upcoming box on the stream tab, and that's a um, that's another place that's getting fed automatically. You don't do anything, but Google Classroom looks at the due dates and puts them the, the soonest ones there. Um, Classroom also automatically sends reminder emails to students about the due date saying like this thing is due tomorrow. And then um, there is also a Google Calendar automatically created for the class. So if students go into Google Calendar, they'll see um, uh, like events um, in their calendar where the due dates are. So those due dates are good because they do feed that information to lots of different spaces within Google tools, but it is kind of something that they do cause anxiety sometimes. And so you really want to have a conversation with your students and your families about due dates. How firm are your due dates? Do you accept late work? Is there a grace period? What's the penalty if they do turn something in late? Um, what if they need more time? You know, what if something is, um, they're dealing with a lot of stuff at home, maybe a sick relative and they just need more time? You know, kind of think about some of those things for, um, you know, how, how you're gonna handle those due dates in your class. Um, so it is, it is good to use the due date feature in classroom when you're creating an assignment, but it also is something to kind of know that it may give students, some students anxiety and they may feel nervous about it. Okay, um, I'd love to hear, let's do a little bit of processing. I know I've talked about a lot of things. We talked about um, topics and being really strategic with topics. And we talked about class, like classwork names, like assignment names. Um, how, so let's go ahead and think about how might you structure your classwork tab to reduce cognitive barriers for students? Are you thinking maybe we'll use emojis? Will you use numbers? Will you put dates um, for your topics? Kind of what's, what's coming up for you that you think you might try? This is also a great way to see other people's ideas and. Um, use them for yourself. So let's see it in the chat, what you're thinking about uh, using to make that, to make those cognitive barriers as um, small as possible. I see emojis, I see using um, weekly dates for topics. Uh, numbering assignments. Um, yeah, topic dates are really great um, because again, everybody, you know, students, it's easier for them to know like what date it is than maybe to know what unit you're in. Um, numbers, being strategic. Um, oh, this is a great question. 
uh, you cannot create subtopics. So you do really have to be strategic with your topics because you, you it's only one level of topics. Um, keeping assignment titles short. Maybe you could use a weekly date with a unit name. That could be a good way yeah, to kind of combine those two things together. Um, emojis are great. I saw, um, I think it was a fourth grade classroom and um, the class that used like a dolphin was like, kind of like their class um mascot in a way. Uh, I think I think the class chose it maybe at the beginning of the year. And so then dolphin activities were like extra challenges. Um, any activity that had like a dolphin in front was an extra challenge. Um, so it was a there's lots of lots of you know neat ways that you can kind of build a culture within your class that then also translates into how you st structure that that space. Okay, thanks for sharing. All right. Some just some other FYI things to know. Uh, when it comes to turning things in, this is what students see. This is a picture from um, the student side of Google Classroom. As a teacher, you cannot see the student side because you're a teacher, not a student, but this is what it looks like on an assignment. It'll have, you know, the instructions off to the side, and then it's got a space where they can attach work and they can add as many attachments as they want. Um, and then there is a turn in button. In order for an assignment to be considered done by Google Classroom, students have to click that turn in button. Um, that's kind of a, sometimes it kind of feels like a, a step that they might forget. You know, they attach their work and you can see anything they attach, but Google Classroom is gonna call it missing until they push that turn in button. So it's really good that they go ahead and click that. It's kind of, it's, a, it's something you might have to kind of practice and remind them from time to time, you know, attach your work and then turn it in. It's kind of like, um, you know, like when they fill out their paper, like they have to do the step of actually going and putting it, you know, maybe in the basket. Um, that's a, so it's, it's just kind of like a, a routine you have to build with students that when they attach their work, then go ahead and click that turn in button. Uh, when they click the turn in button, it changes to a, I think it's an unsubmit button. So like if they attach the wrong thing or they want to uh, make changes, they can always unsubmit it, you know, take it back and work on it some more. It is really good to know that when they click that turn in button, um, classroom, just like a piece of paper. So just like when they hand you a piece of paper, they can't write on it anymore. Classroom does the same thing with their assignment. So you don't have to worry about a kid turning in a blank thing and then typing it up later, right? Um, so when they click that turn in button, classroom takes away their editing permissions. They can look at it, but they can't edit it. Remember, they can take it back if they want to edit it again. But um, when they click turn in, it's like they handed over that paper. And so um, it's kind of nice because it gives you peace of mind as, as a teacher that if they submitted it by the due date, then what, what is turned in is what is turned in. Um, if you want students to be able to edit something again, like maybe they turn in a rough draft and you want to give it back, um, there's a return button that teachers can click to give it back. Um, you can also, when you return it, you can give a score or not. It's kind of, it's kind of up to you. You can decide if you want to put a score on it or not. In the example of like a rough draft where I'm handing it back, you know, maybe I would not put a score on it, or maybe if it's the final thing they turned in, I'd give it a score and then I would give it back. Um, we talked a little bit about the stream. Um, remember, that was the very first thing. That's the first thing you always see um, when you come into classroom. That's great for announcements or reminders. Um, students do get an email automatically when uh, you post an announcement in the stream. So it sends all the students um, an email letting them know. And you can schedule those announcements and posts in the stream in advance. So just like an assignment, you can also schedule announcements in, adv in advance. The stream also has different levels of settings and permissions. Um, Students have the ability, if, if you have it turned on, students can post themselves in the stream. Um, there's also an option where students can only comment on stuff in the stream. And then there's also an option where they can't do anything. Um, I like the commenting feature because it allows students to ask questions about something I posted. Uh, it also allows students to kind of help each other. We had a culture in my classroom of we all help each other. If you know the answer to the question you see someone else posted, go ahead and answer it. You know. I didn't, the teacher didn't have to be the only person who could answer questions. Um, so you can kind of decide, you know, what you feel comfortable with. You can also decide um, by default, when you post an assignment, classroom posts an announcement about it in the stream. I usually turned that off because I wanted the stream just to be my stuff. So you can, you can kind of decide what classroom puts in your stream for you. And um, here's what that looks like. So the, this again, that this is that main page of classroom. I can tell I'm on the stream because the dark thick line is under stream. Um, so here's the stream. I can announce something to my class. I've got an example announcement here. And um, students, you know, depending upon your settings. Uh, so for example, my setting here, it says students can only comment. So students can actually write, uh, write a response. They can be like, yay, I'm so excited. Or um, thanks for the reminder. Or, oh, is this going to, is this test you're announcing? Is it going to cover 
you know, these topics or what's going to be on it. So it's nice. They can ask questions right there as well. Um, and then I like, I like the setting to hide notifications. Um, because again, that's talking about like stuff you put in the classwork tab classroom will post it as an announcement on your stream. I didn't like that. I thought it made it cluttered. And so I, I usually like to hide it, but you can choose to have it, um, put, uh, notifications on your stream page if you want. Something that we see teachers sometimes do is they put assignments here in this um, stream page. That's not a good idea usually because uh, students don't have any way to turn something in. It's just, it's, you know, think of an announcement like a, a blast. You know, there's not an option for students to turn something in. It's also really hard to find later. You'll see there are no topics or any way to navigate. You just have to scroll down until you find the thing again. So this is a really great space for um, kind of like, important now stuff, right? Not stuff they're going to want to have to find later. Um, so that's what I would, I, I, I don't recommend putting resources or an assignments here because students, it will be really hard for them to find later. Um, is the stream searchable? Kind of. You can use the keyboard shortcut control F, or if you're on a Mac command F and you can search the, the page. Um, but there's no, yeah, there's no like magnifying glass anywhere to search the stream. And so students have to kind of know that trick in order to search for it. So it's really, it's really hard to find stuff in the past on the stream. It's really more of like a current space. Um, so that's just kind of something that's good to know. So I, I would not post anything students need to find, you know, in a week or in two weeks, uh, because it'll just get buried down below. Um, some tips and tricks. We're winding down. We've got about 10 minutes left in this session. Uh, you can adjust your email notifications with Classroom. So Classroom, when you first start using Classroom, you might notice it sends you a lot of emails. I don't, I don't like a lot of emails myself. Some people like the emails because they're good reminders. So it's up to you. You can choose. Uh, you can set your own settings in your um, as to how often Classroom emails you about stuff. Um, to do that, these are the steps. Uh, I would say that when you create your Classroom, you know, then maybe see like kind of after a week or so, like how it feels and then go and adjust your um, notification settings. But um, I'm gonna go to the stack of pancakes and at the very bottom of the step, stack of pancakes, there's settings and you'll find it inside of there. Um, for example, Classroom will send you an email anytime a student turns in late work. I found that to be really useful because I didn't go back and check old assignments. So when kids turn on something late, I tended to not know unless classroom sent me that email. So like that's a, an email I left on. Um, but for example, when um, you can have it so that classroom will email you anytime a student um, adds a private comment to their assignment. And I didn't find that helpful necessarily because I would go, I'm looking at their assignments anyway. You know, I don't, I don't need to be notified of the private comments. So you can kind of, again, decide which, which notifications you want and which ones you don't. You can also turn off notifications entirely for a single class. So if you're in your co-teachers, you know, like a collaboration partners class, you might want to turn off all the emails from their class because you'll get all the notifications about students as late work and whatnot. Um, so it's kind of nice because you can decide if you get notif notifications for a class, which notifications you receive, but you can also just turn them off for a whole class, which is nice. Okay. Uh, grading and feedback. I did a whole webinar. Um, about a year and a half ago about assignments and feedback in Google Classroom. And so that's kind of like a level two, like when you've gotten your feet with Google Classroom and you're like, oh, I kind of understand how this works. I see how to do these things. Um, this webinar I've got linked here on slide 32 is, um, I think it's 45 minutes and it goes more in depth around like tips and tricks and like how to do group work and how to, um, you know, really kind of get deeper into, um, you know, powerful assignments and grading and that kind of stuff and how to do feedback and everything within Google Classroom. Um, I recommend like, you know, like I said, once you've gotten your feet wet, so maybe, you know, in like September or so, um, check out that webinar. It's really, um, I think it's really, really useful and really helpful to kind of, again, get, get, just get some ideas and tips and tricks. You know, you may not do everything I say in that webinar, but it'll give you some ideas um, or like, oh, I never thought about doing it that way. That's a, that's a, that's something I want to try. Um, when you are, when students do submit work, you can leave comments on it. You can leave overall comments on the file as a whole. You can also leave pinned comments, um, which is attached like to a specific word or document. If you've ever like commented on something in Google Docs or in Google Slides, it's the same idea that you can, you know, select a sentence and put a comment on that sentence. And then any co-teacher in the class can see and leave comments. That's again, an opportunity where maybe an ERF or a special education teacher or a paraeducator or an admin could go in and leave, you know, feedback or comments on a student's work. 
Um, and it's really good to kind of keep in mind that learning happens when we learn from mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. I, the brain works that we learn something so much more strongly when we mess it up first, right? We get it wrong and we're like, oh, that's how it goes. That's that, that's going to make a stronger neural connection. And so when kids get mistakes, it's important to again, close that feedback loop and not just give them a grade and be like, oh, you made a mistake. That's, that's, that's no good. You know, it's great to give them a chance to, um, you know, maybe fix it or redo it and turn it back in. Uh, you can return work, like I said, without adding a score. And so you might want to think about that, that um, I've seen teachers that will return anytime somebody turns something in, they return the work um, with a comment, like a, a bit of feedback and students have to respond to that comment and then resubmit the work. And then the teacher would add the score and return it, you know, finally done. So you might think that's pretty tedious to do on every single assignment. Um, but, you know, you might choose some assignments throughout the year, or if you're working on like a, a standard or a skill specifically, you might choose to use that type of technique where you return it without a score, but with a comment and students have to address that feedback, that comment, and then resubmit. And then you can give them their score and give them paperback. Because a lot of times if you just give a score, they just look at the score and don't look at your comments. All right, tips and tricks. These are kind of a random smattering of resources and tips. So I just stuck them kind of all on one page, but they're just some good things to think about. This slide particularly is great for our third norm. I'm gonna cycle back to our third norm. Take what you can today and come back for more later. These might be, I guess there's eight things. These might be eight things too many and that's okay. Do not feel like you have to learn all the things that you have the deck. Um, you can always reach out to uh, the help desk. Uh, sometimes people think the help desk is only for broken stuff. It's not. We answer all matter of tech questions. So, you know, if in a month you're like, oh, what was that um, that thing that Jessica said about, you know, how, how do I return work without putting a grade on it? What was, what was that she said about that was feedback? Submit a help desk ticket. Help desk will assign it to me and I'll answer your question. So I just really want you to um, think about you know, that third norm again, because we're, I've, I've talked about a lot of things, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to have learned everything I talked about today. Uh, so eight tips and tricks. My first one uh, is there is a to-do page inside of classroom where you can see all of the ungraded work. Um, you can sort it by class, but it's kind of nice sometimes to see like what you have left to grade, or if you like got through some of them, but didn't get through all. Um, so that that's a nice, a nice space in classroom just to see what, what maybe is, you know, is still ungraded. We talked about being able to post stuff. Um, you can save stuff as a draft if it's not ready to be posted yet. So you might work on an assignment or a project um, and you can also then schedule it to post automatically. So I actually, I use the scheduling feature a lot when I knew I was gonna be gone. Google Classroom was a great sub plan because I would put stuff up there and schedule to post the morning of um, when I knew I'd be out. And then students you know, knew that if I was gone, the work was gonna be in Google Classroom. That was the classroom routine that we had. Um, and they could, you know, they had Chromebooks, we had Chromebooks at the school I was at and they would pull them out and work on their stuff. Um, and they knew that, you know, it was due at the end of class. So um, that was a schedule feature I used a lot. There, we talked about that um, Google Classroom Guardian email summaries. They had a resource that you could share with families. We also have a resource just about Google Classroom. What do the different buttons do? How do you turn something in? So if you have um, families who are having a hard time or students are having a hard time with Classroom, we have a resource just for them. This is that classroom synergy sync that I was talking about where it'll sync your roster. If you are a sixth through 12th grade teacher, it will also sync your grades across. So if you score something in Google Classroom, that score will move over to synergy. It's really nice. Um, I highly encourage you check that out. If you're, especially if you're a sixth through 12th grade teacher because it saves you grading the thing twice. Um, there is a way to post to multiple classes at once. So, you know, example, I, again, I taught high school. I had, um, the same class in first, third, and fourth. And so I would post the same assignment to all those classes that I had to remake it every time. And then you can also, we talk about reusing posts. Uh, this was a really great tip that I picked up from Alice Keeler. And she mentioned that you can use private comments instead of docs for short submissions. So she talked about, you know, like having students submit a topic sentence or submitting like their topic for a speech or something like that, you know, where they're submitting something really short. If you have them all put it in a Google doc, then you have to open all of their Google docs, which can be tedious and can be time consuming to open up a file for every single student. And so she said, you know, instead of having students attach a file with the sentence, with the one sentence in it, have them um, put a private comment on the assignment instead. And um, that was, you know, instead of opening all of these docs, you can really quickly skim through all of the comments. So that was a, 
Um, and I thought that was a neat tip. I mentioned that Classroom can make a copy of a digital template for each student. So I've got a video here on how that, how that, how you do that. And then the last thing I've got is I've got some really great um, assignment ideas within Classroom. They are um, relatively, uh, I would say relatively content agnostic, um, that they're about, you know, writing, collaborating, and then, you know, claim evidence and elaboration. Uh, these are really neat. I recommend you check them out. They are, you know, thinking about how to do it in Google Classroom, how to make a really powerful learning activity for students in Google Classroom. So at some point in time, those are those are pretty great to kind of look over. We also have tons of Google resources as we're winding down our last couple minutes here. Um, you can find all Google resources by going to sfusd.edu slash Google. You'll find all of our stuff. Um, and again, like I said, you can submit a help desk ticket. Any questions you have, um, feel free to submit that help desk ticket and it'll get routed. You, Google questions get routed to me. And so I will be happy to answer your question um, via help desk ticket. Thank you, Allison, read my mind. It's time for the feedback form. Um, please take a moment to fill out the feedback form. We love to hear, you know, what you liked, what you didn't. This um, Every time before I do this session or before I do any session for Digital District Day, uh, I look up old feedback to see what people liked and what they didn't before. Um, so please take a moment and give me that feedback. I want to hear the good, the bad, the ugly. Let me know what you liked, what to keep, and then how to maybe make it better. I know it's hard. This was a one hour session and we had so much to talk about. Um, so I know that I just talked your ear off and I'm really sorry about that. Um, but the good news is that this research is here for you. So that third norm, come back for more later. When you're setting up your classroom, pull up this deck and have the two side by side. Um, there's, there's certainly no shame in using a resource to do something. So, um, I know it was a bit of a whirlwind. I hope you got, uh, you know, at least a couple of new things today. And it was really great to see you all. Thank you, Jessica. That was awesome. And I know there are a lot of other questions about payment and sign in. I'm going to suggest people during the break visit the Digital District Day help desk or submit a help ticket. Um, unfortunately, Jessica and I are going to have to leave at this time because both of us need to be in sessions for the next time block and have a few other things. So we can't handle answering any more questions at this time, but go to the Digital District Day website. You, there you can find that help desk just for Digital District Day and feel free to use the help tickets, the help desk to submit tickets. If you still are having questions about sign-in or payment, everyone, we want to get paid. I promise. Yes. You deserve the money. <laughs> All right. Thanks everyone. Take care.